Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We come to worship you, to celebrate your birth, that you came to this world as a baby, to live your life and to sacrifice yourself so that you might save us. We want to praise you today and we want to celebrate your humility, your, your honor, your glory. Be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen.
At this time, I would like to invite the Collinses forward for the lighting of the Advent candle. Up pondering what kind of salutation this was the angel said to her do not be afraid Mary for you have found favor with God and behold to you you will conceive in her in your womb and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus he will be great and will be called the son of most high and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over those over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How could this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered to her, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the anticipation and the buildup and the ceremony that you have brought uh, to the coming of your son. You did not leave it as uh, just something that was not, that went unnoticed. You made it something that you used to glorify and, and to bring forward. Lord, we thank you that you show us how you work in this world and in our lives. And we want to thank you and praise you this season. In Jesus' name, amen.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the gift of giving, that you take everything that we have and you multiply it and you use it for your will. We ask that you would, this season, use every cent of this to progress your kingdom for the great deeds that you want to do. In your name we pray.
Well, you are all just on your game this morning. Good job, all of you. Piano playing, special music, choir, everybody's on. Which, Christmas is the time to bring it, right? But bring it all the time. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter two. Straight to this Christmas story. Now, this is the culmination of where we have been building for pretty much this entire month, right? In anticipation towards Christmas. Last three weeks, we've been talking about the birth of a, you know, leading up to the birth of a baby boy, this, this Messiah. We saw God's faithfulness, uh, Zechariah, his faithfulness in the temple with him and his wife Elizabeth. They were finally given a son. And then we saw God's faithfulness to bring about the Messiah and the forerunner. And then last week, we got to talk about God being able to do the impossible. And this week, we get to look at another one of God's methods, his humility. Now, for those of you who came here today hoping to celebrate the birth of a baby boy, I will tell you, my son may not be here yet, but there's one in this story that we get to celebrate. <laughs> so we, we, we still get to, get to have fun. Uh, as a quick side note, if by some chance my wife happens to go into labor while I'm up here, I might have to leave. <laughs> um, just to put it blankly. So I'll, 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 but there's a small chance of that happening. So we, we should be good. <laughs> um, so, in the spirit of Christmas, uh, there's many stories that we usually look at. One of the things we usually look at is maybe a Christmas carol. Maybe we have this idea of a Scrooge, somebody who is not really in the Christmas spirit, not, not doing well. And now, I have a story that is kind of a lot about a Scrooge. Uh, this is a true story. It happened in the year 2000. Two businessmen met. And they were trying to find an ar arrangement. John was the CEO of a multi-million dollar company. And they did business all over America. In fact, you have heard of them. Reed, on the other hand, had a small but moderately successful business that he'd started online. However, Reed was starting to lose money. People hadn't quite entirely found him and latched onto his concept yet. And so he had proposed this meeting with John and he was there to pitch that the two companies merge. In fact, this big company could buy out this small company and this way, for $50 million, John would take care of the physical product while Reed took care of the online side of things. John laughed at Reed's proposal and pretty much laughed him right out the door. He called him a very small niche business and basically said he was never going to fly. But four years later, John would realize that Reed's business was gaining competitive steam. He was finally getting out there. And he tried to implement changes in his own business in order to start to keep up with what Reed was doing, but it, it was too late. A couple of years later, John would be replaced as CEO of this multi-million dollar company. And this company, by 2010, would be entirely bankrupt and go out of business. John Antioco's pride and arrogance as CEO in a large company like Blockbuster had sunk him and eventually sunk the entire company. But Reed Hastings, however, currently is worth over $2 billion personally because of his very small niche business, Netflix. Pride and arrogance can keep us, it, it can cost us a lot. You can think that we are too big to fail. But that's actually not what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the other side of things. What could cause this from happening? What could keep this from happening? Humility. I want to look specifically at the story of Jesus, this birth story in Luke chapter 2, and I want to look at the humble circumstances in which our Savior was born, and I want it to persuade us 
to emulate Christ in his humility, God in his humility. This, is, this season is completely centered around him, but he is humble through it all. So, starting in chapter 2, verse 1, let's read. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered for a census. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to a firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. So, a little bit of background. First, we see that Luke gives us this background that there was a census decreed by Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire. Now, Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar was never actually a Caesar himself, and so Augustus, uh, well, he wasn't an emperor. Augustus took on the empire himself, seizing this power. And so he ruled from 30 BC to about 14 AD. And so the first Roman emperor was still in charge when Jesus was born. And he issues this decree across the entire Roman empire, this huge empire, and says, I need to register all of these people. I need to know who is in my empire. And this is for multiple reasons. One is, it's just nice to know who's there, but this is a big empire. This is going to take a while. I need to know for tax reasons, and I need to know just in case some, they decide to issue a rebellion or something, I want to keep the peace, that I know who is in what region. This is helping him rule his empire, and it's helping him get some tax money. And so... This will be carried out regionally by the governor, Quirinius. Now, this would have been something that the people in subjection, such as the Israelites, would not be too happy about because it's almost like the emperor is throwing this in their face saying, you need to submit. I say jump, you say how high. You're, you're going to register for this census. And so every firstborn male would go down to, in, in Israel, would go to the land the place where he owned land, and he would register for this census. Well, the way that Israel divided up land, they would all go to their ancestral home. And so Joseph, being from the line of David, took Mary and they headed to Bethlehem. Now this says that they are engaged. A little bit of background on Jewish marriage. It involved a period of time where, when they would be betrothed to each other, the groom would actually leave the bride, uh, sometimes up to a period of about a year. And they were legally married. Like, in order to break off this engagement, you actually had to get a certificate of divorce. Like, this is binding. And usually they would leave, they would prepare a place, they would prepare a house, get the house ready for them to come back and dwell there. Go and build your house, honey, I'll be back. And then when they come back, they would have this huge celebration. And this is the marriage feast. And this, this period was meant to make sure that this couple was pure. You have the patience to wait this period of time before anything happens. And so we see something very odd here in these circumstances. For some reason, Joseph didn't feel comfortable leaving Mary alone. They're engaged, they're, they're married, but they're not married. And whether it was the circumstances surrounding Mary's pregnancy, because in the eyes of everyone else, this might be, a, this is a social stigma. You're, you're pregnant out of wedlock. This is not, 
the way that this is supposed to go. And so maybe small towns, he probably didn't feel comfortable leaving her up there because the penalty for adultery is death. And if they think she's an adulterer, or it might even just be the fact that they were poor and he couldn't afford to leave her alone. She's very far along in her pregnancy and he doesn't just want to come back and, oh, hey, here's my kid. And so he, for some reason, he takes her with him all the way down to Bethlehem, a long, like 60 mile travel for a, you know, like nine month pregnant lady. My wife's shaking her head like, no. <laughs> but while they're in Bethlehem, Mary gives birth to her firstborn. And Luke underscores this point. He says, firstborn. He wants to make sure that we know this is Mary's first kid. She is still a virgin. So Mary takes this baby, swaddles him, lays him in a manger because there is no room elsewhere. The presence of this manger, and therefore presence of animals, tells us that this was not a glamorous birth. I mean, well, it is, right? But this is not an ideal location. We go to hospitals for a reason. Did you know that? Like, they're, they're clean. They're, they're antiseptic. They've, they've got that smell that just kind of really, you know, gets your nostrils really kind of stung. But that's for a reason, because they're clean. They are antiseptic. They are a great place to give birth. You have professionals there. Now, they probably had a midwife here that helped, but this is not a clean place. This is not a place to have a baby. And this is not a place to lay a baby. This is very odd. And this is to underscore something. I want you to, if you are here, think back to the birth of, you know, the expectation and the birth of John the Baptist. Zechariah and Elizabeth in the previous chapter. And let's compare this with their circumstances. Zechariah was of a priestly line. So was Elizabeth. They married. They were, they were super priestly line. This is, you know, they can only make themselves more powerful. Um, it's a joke. But Zechariah was ordered to come to Jerusalem because of his priestly duty. But Joseph was ordered to go to Bethlehem because of a political duty. Many others were as well. Zechariah and Elizabeth were old and barren and had good blood, but Mary and Joseph were of David's line. They were poor, and they haven't even tried to have children yet. These are two completely different circumstances. The angel appeared, Gabriel appeared to Zechariah in the middle of the temple, which is exactly where you would expect an angel to appear. But then the angel appeared to Mary in Nazareth. circumstances surrounding the birth of John are more culturally honorable and traditional than the circumstances leading up to the birth of Jesus. John got everybody going. It got everybody, it got the entire temple establishment amped up. But here, with Jesus, it's not going that way. In fact, the circumstances leading up to the birth of Jesus are seen as questionable at best. Even this placement. Jesus was laid in a feeding trough for animals. This is not the place you would expect a king, let alone a Messiah, a Savior, let alone God incarnate in the flesh to be born. This is all very odd. But then we're introduced to some new characters in the story. It just keeps going. Read in verse 8. In the same region, some shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby 
wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to the people he favors. So here we see angels as the shepherds. In the same area that Jesus was born, likely just a little bit outside the city walls of Bethlehem, maybe a little bit further out in this region, there are shepherds watching their flocks in the darkness of night. Like they're out there 24-7. Now shepherds in a lot of Middle Eastern cultures did not have a great reputation. They're a little rough around the edges. They're pretty much blue collar workers. They're, this is the job that nobody else really wants and so we're gonna, just gonna shove you out in the field. You take care of the sheep. I mean, think about this. They work 24 seven with animals in a hot desert. They're not the cleanest, they're not the best smelling people. And so because of the nature of this job, it kept them from being ceremonial, ceremonially clean. They were not really the type that would just enter the temple and go and clean themselves up and make it to the synagogue. We had a job and the job is not pleasant. Other people didn't really want us there in the first place. It made it very hard for them to go to church. And so, this made it very difficult to stay in good standing with the religious system. And the irony is, in this region, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, likely the flocks that they were keeping track of were actually going to be meant for the temple sacrifices. The irony that the people who are taking care of the thing for the thing, that is the whole reason that the temple is around is to do the sacrifices, is that they, <coughs> unclean. In fact, they were considered so unreliable, they were not even permitted to provide testimony, testimony in court. Like, oh, you're a shepherd, we're just going to throw what you say right out, because we can't trust you. So if you're ever being judged for your profession, it could always be worse. Somebody might believe you. But the interesting thing here is, like, Israelite culture. Throughout their history, you see they're a bunch of shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. And God reveals himself in the Psalms and throughout all of Scripture as a shepherd. John 10, Jesus says, I am a shepherd. And right here, we see the first people who get attested to this gets announced to the birth of Christ are shepherds. Angel appears to him and says, I'm going to invite you to worship. Church is in session. Let's go. You might not get to go to the synagogue. You might not get to go to the temple. But hey, you're going to be the first one to go see the Messiah. The angel brings good news. This Savior, this Messiah, this Lord is born in Bethlehem, just right over the hill. The angel even gives them a way to find him. He is the only baby that's going to be wrapped in cloths laying in a manger. Like, this odd placement of a baby has turned into a signpost. Oh, this kid, this is your Messiah. So there was a purpose. The angels say, hey, this is how you're going to find him. Now, I think, I imagine these shepherds just kind of walking through trying to figure out where this baby is. Like, this is, this is kind of odd. Like, okay, I'm just going to go into a city and listen for the crying. Or maybe they're kind of peeking into people's windows. I don't know. But they were given a sign for how to find him. But then this angel turns into a multitude of angels. More of them appear. In fact, a host. It says an angelic host appears and starts praising God. Now, this, ho this word host... We can kind of read it, read past it very quickly. But this word host is actually what is used, army. An angelic army appears. In fact, it kind of gives this indication that there are ranks, militarily ranks. There are many multitudes of angels. Now, one angel 
historically in scripture is very terrifying. Like, I think it's like what one angel kills like 124,000 people at one point. And you have many tears, many ranks, many different kinds showing up here and they're all singing one song. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on earth to those he has favor on. This is a royal celebration. We see these humble circumstances down here with Christ being born in these very unlikely, very kind of derogatory place, this, this, this very low place. And heaven is losing it. They are having a rave. They are having a celebration. They are going nuts. In fact, this announcement, a king has been born. A prince is born. This is the son of the king of all the heavens of all creation. And all of a sudden, how would you not expect that his armies, his military, his, his administration would not announce that to creation? This is humble, but this is extravagant. This is happening simultaneous. This is the greatest party ever. And the first people they tell are the rough around the edges, unclean, blue collar workers in the field, not the temple. Why? The birth of John the Baptist got the religious establishment all up in arms ready and worked up and excited about what God was doing, but the birth of Jesus is all about the common person. The birth of Jesus is all about you and I. He relates to us on a level where we, we don't clean ourselves up to come to him. We come to him as we are. Shepherds were the first people invited to worship the Messiah. So the angels depart and the shepherds are left with a decision. Should we go? They start talking with each other. Leaving their flocks is not a great thing because flocks kind of get themselves in danger, especially at night when you can't see what's coming in the dark. But they decide, let's go. Let's look in verse 15. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem to see what's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message and were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, just as they had been told. So the shepherds decided to visit Jesus. They decided to risk it. Leave these flocks. We'll go, we'll go get a glimpse of them and then come back. And so when they saw it was true that there was actually a baby lying in this manger, they made it known to Mary and Joseph and anybody else who was around. They said, this is a basic part of Christianity. We make known what's made known to us. God reveals something to us. We make it known. The shepherds were just passing on what was given to them. Now, do you think maybe they'd look a little crazy saying, like telling Mary and Joseph, hey, this is how we found you. This bright light appeared in the middle of a uh, field. It was an angel, and it told me how to find you. Like, it, it, it's almost like they had an encounter with a UFO. Like, how do I tell this to them? But th look at this. They shared what the Lord made known to them, even if it was awkward even if it was extraordinary, even if it seemed like they were cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And look at the response. And instead of saying, you're weird, get out of here, they said, the response is wonder. Those who heard it had wonder. They, they were amazed. Wow, this kid who's just born in a barn, born and laid in this manger, this kid is the Messiah. He is Lord. He is God in the flesh. And then Mary treasured these things in her heart. She kept this close to her chest. She said, what they're saying about this kid, this, this kid, I cherish that. She thought about it a lot. And then these shepherds returned to God. They returned to their jobs glorifying and praising God. And this is a proper response. 
The proper response to seeing the humility of God is to praise him. Think back to heaven throwing this celebration, throwing the rave, going nuts. At the same time as Messiah, Lord and God, Jesus was born to a poor, ostracized family, lay in the manger. The only people to celebrate were these random, unclean shepherds from a field. Paul takes the incarnation of Christ a little further. We don't just see the humility in these circumstances, but in Philippians 2, verse 5, Paul says, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It says Jesus actively let go of heaven. The fact that a God would become, would even come to this earth in, in the flesh of a man it is insulting to his nature as God. Like, he had to become something else. Like, he humbled himself. He said, you know, I will let go of this because I love them. I will let go of this. And he came, he came not as this big, glorious king. He came as this small little baby. You know, babies have to be taken care of. Somebody has to take care of them. And, you know, somebody changed Jesus' diaper. That blows my mind. And he didn't just come as a baby that had to be taken care of. He became obedient. He was raised in a, in a poor family in the middle of nowhere under not-so-grand circumstances. Probably seen as a a child born out of wedlock, conceived out of wedlock. How is he ever going to be great? He died the death of a slave. Crucifixion was only reserved for people who were not Roman citizens. It was too brutal. Everything about his life points to humility. God could have come with a big commanding voice. He could have come and tried to pressure us. He came humbly. Jesus resurrected from the dead and every name, every tongue will confess that he is Lord at his name. Are you humble? Do you know him? It's connected. We have to let go of our pride in order to confess him as Savior. This Christmas, don't be like Blockbuster. Think you have it all together. Think, I'm too big to fail. I'm, I've got things going for me. Humility is necessary. I don't want you to walk out this door unless you trust him as your Savior. I want him to work in you. I want him to, to move you. If you're, if you're having any kind of trouble, come see me. Come talk to me, please. If you need prayer, I will be right down here in the front. If you need to talk about something, but don't let this Christmas go by without understanding that he, God of the universe, is humble enough that he came after you. It is not too far for him. He does the impossible through humility.
I believe we have a business meeting after this. No? Oh, that was in there. Okay. It's Christmas. It's Christmas after this. All right. Let's pray and go home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for just the joy of your birth, that you come and you, you love on us, that you came humbly in these circumstances to, for us, to pay for our sins, to love on us. We want to just thank you this season. Let us not leave here without praising you, just like those angels, just like those shepherds. We love you, Lord. You are glorious. In your holy name of Jesus, we pray, amen.